Thanks for the introduction. I always uh, feel like a rock star if someone says, like, give it up for. That's really cool. Sorry for the delay. It was probably because I was late and uh, we did not copy the presentation to the laptop. But I need some uh, internet connection to show you a couple of trailers. And uh, yeah, the topic of the talk, as you can see, is working with big IP. So, um, you know, why? The first question that we're going to answer is, why would anyone let you work with their IP? Like you can see, we, we did all those fancy stuff with the birds here. They were originally not known for things like that. And uh, in general, I try to, to pick examples from the games that we did and made um, to, to give you information about how it is to work with IP, what things you have to consider, and so forth. So I'm going through a deck with samples from the games we did, and um, of course, you can ask your questions afterwards as well. So um, yeah, why would anyone let us uh, work with that? In the, in the case of Angry Birds Epic, you will see soon what happened there. But in general, uh, you might think, like, hey, if I have a cool IP, why would I give it to anyone else? So there's a couple of reasons why anyone would do that. Mostly, I think it's because uh, they can't do it themselves or don't want to do it themselves. But of course, uh, a lot of studios have very good ideas as well for movie IP, for whatever IP. It could be from a totally different industry, so the guys won't even be able to make a game. So um, in the end, you can see those reasons. And uh, of course, you also, as a studio, have to work towards achieving this uh, trust from somebody else that they will actually give you an IP. So during the first seven years when we had our company, it was very hard to acquire uh, good material. And we did a lot of the time, we just did our own concepts. Uh, we also got funded from the FFF Bavaria. So this is also a valid way to get started uh, or to, f to finance uh, projects that are own IP stuff. Um, yeah, but let's, uh, let's dive into it. and see what you have to be aware of when you want to work with IP. So first of all, you really have to know the brand and the market that you're working for and with. Um, a lot of research is, is key here. Um, and I'm not meaning like, OK, I'm going to watch some Avengers movie, and then I'm, I'm the pro, right? I know already what's going to happen here. No, you have to really understand target audience. You have to understand uh, what's, what did the brand do in the past? What are they going to do in the future? Or you have to, to do your research properly and find out as much as you can on all of these different uh, factors. It's also important to know how successful IP was on specific markets. For example, uh, how many how much did the movie make in, in what time? And is there maybe is there a sequel? You know, kinds of things like that. Because if there's a sequel, you might want to uh, make a game that comes out, comes out at the same time as the movie comes out. And things like that have to be considered. Especially important also is the target audience. Um, I think a lot of brands are just being abused, more or less, to generate more money, of course. right? Like games are being made all the time with very uh, let's say, uh, questionable <laughs> things in mind. Like There was games for very, very popular uh, IP, like the Matrix or stuff like that, which was very, very little successful in the games market because they just did not really take into consideration what target audience and what kind of game might they expect, what's important to them. They just thought you can make the money off the IP. Yeah? Back in the days, it was also a lot the case that you had to pay to acquire licenses for most of the brands because people thought, oh, their IP is so super special that you have to be paid for it in advance. Nowadays, this has very much changed. And most of the time, um, for, for let's say, for, I'm specifically talking about movies now, but in, in general, people are also happy if you would pick their IP and make a game out of it because games are very big. They are one of the fastest growing markets uh, still. And of course, those third parties will benefit if you make a good game out of their IP. So it's not like uh, you know you have to, to, to beg for it and pay money in advance anymore most of the time. So what you really have to show if you pitch something to someone is that you understand their brand, that you know what it's about and what their core values are. You know, like for Angry Birds, for example, it's very important that it, we understood when we made the first game that it's for a kid's audience. and. Uh, you know, we, we did an RPG, and we weren't even allowed to use sharp weapons in it just because of that simple fact. There were a lot of other things which were no problem at all. They have a good sense of humor, all of these kind of things. But um, yeah, I'll show you now what we originally did before we were able to make the Angry Birds game. Let's hope this works as well. 
doesn't seem to. I got a couple other trailers. This one uh, I embedded in the presentation. Maybe it's not working. It's, I don't know. It's not really that important because this video just shows an old prototype or like an old video we did for a very different game which was called 100 Heroes. And this one had little characters, just human characters more or less, who assume different roles like the paladin and warriors and mages, you know, that kind of stuff. And we pitched that to Rovio and they thought, oh, that's very cool, we can do that with Angry Birds. And we were like, really? Why? <laughs> What's that got to do with Angry Birds? What we didn't know at this time was that they actually tried to get their IP into very different market space and make it available for a very different crowd because they just had those slingshot games going on which you maybe know of that they make the big success in the first place but then they tried to reinvent their own uh, brand and they came up with a racing game which was I think the first one made at around the same time that we did ours. And uh, yeah, we came up with this RPG idea and they thought it would suit the brand very well. And then we worked on a specific pitch for the Angry Birds IP, which included <coughs> where we came up with the idea that these headgears that you can change that you saw on the first slide, that those kind of things make the difference between like a mage or a, a paladin and things like that. They loved the idea and that's more or less already uh, was our entry into the, the brand and then we were able to make a prototype and so forth. Uh, it's a bit sad that I can't show that, but it's not a big thing. Um, so, like I said before, there have been some restrictions, of course. So, anytime you work with an IP, you probably encounter those uh, restrictions because the IP holders, they might want you to use things in a different way or in a specific way and, you know, to, to stick to their brand values. In this case, like I said, it's for kids. It can be violent. Uh, which was a bit um, tricky because we had those uh, birds fighting the pigs, right? And when they knocked them down, what we do with them? So actually, no, none of these died. They just rolled over and have been unconscious, more or less. Now, all these little things were important, but in the end, it didn't really make the game worse. Not in any way. It was even possible to pick a lot of those things and make it more fun because it's a diff it was a different thing, and it was not like you always have used to. Just the sword, blood, dead. No, we just did it differently and we had a lot of different fun animations and all those animations or a lot of those had to go through the approval process because the animations had to look like the original ones more or less and also they did cartoons and things like that and all of these kind of things related to the art style really had to be close or more or less the same than the brand was before. Everything else, like the whole gameplay, the design, you know, like from the meta core game, everything we did there was totally uh, owned by us and we had creative freedom about it. We just had to be sure to stick to those simple rules and brand values and uh, yeah, there have been a couple of things and in the end it was not a big problem. We just worked our way around it. Yeah, and eventually during live uh, operations a couple of years into the uh, life ops of the game, we also took ownership of all of that because Rovio just, you know, they didn't want to care for it that much anymore and so they gave it completely to us and uh, in the end we, we had this game running for uh, more or less five years. It's still out there and it's been very successful and uh, yes, it was also a game changer for us that we had a concept that we could make with an IP. If we would have made the game without Angry Birds, I'm pretty sure most likely nobody would have cared for it and it was really a good game like, of course, that's easy to say, but I think we had very good critics and also very well received from the community, and there has people playing the game for two or three years, and this definitely shows you that it's a good game. Um, but the thing is, if you make a good game and nobody knows it and nobody sees it, then it doesn't matter, right? So IP is just a very, very big help, and in the end, it doesn't really matter that much what IP you took, as long as you think it fits your game or the game fits the IP and you can make something cool out of it, something new and original. And to underline this point, uh, I can show you a trailer <laughs> which at the first uh, glance you might also think like, what has that to do with Angry Birds? But um, let's see, I hope this works. Should work, we just tried it out. Uh, that looks good.
So this was the first teaser that they made when the game went to soft launch. And in the end, it was like something that nobody had on their mind, right, for Angry Birds. They didn't know what kind of game it was. But there was wild speculations on the internet what kind of game this would be. And so this really, really helped uh, push the brand. And it was also a very original take on it. And Rovio, I have to say, it's really cool. They excel in doing very fun and interesting uh, marketing stunts or, or trailers and, and all those kind of things surrounding their, their IP, which really things stand out from a lot of the others you can see on the market. <coughs> so we, after Angry Birds Epic, we actually got a follow-up deal. And that was the game is called Angry Birds Evolution. It's also still out there. Came, uh, it was in, been released in 2017. And it was originally based on the movie that they had um, cooking. So nobody knew that the movie was, was coming. Or I think maybe it was already communicated. But there was no pictures or no information about it. And uh, people didn't even know that the birds in the movie is, and, and the pigs were going to have limbs. So in the end, we had to pitch for a game which we didn't even know what the movie would look like. And uh, yeah, we kind of reimagined it in the right way. And that's why they also gave us the project. And for a long, long time, we had a very, very strict confidentiality policy because nobody knew about all of it. We couldn't show any artwork. We, we had to be very, very careful and all of this kind of stuff. So these are also restrictions you have to be aware of when working with IP that sometimes it's very confidential and um, yeah, you can't even tell, I don't know, your wife about it or whatever, because it's just strict policy, legal implications. You know, you have to sign contracts for that if you get uh, a deal like that. So in the end, we also did a lot of live events here. And we also collaborated with non-gaming brands, which makes it, again, interesting. Because inside this game, we worked with other IP, or Rovio in general does. They try to make deals with uh, sports clubs or with, uh, in this case, with rock bands. So you can see here, there have been a lot of different birds and pigs in the game which were related to some pop culture references. And some of them, like to the right, uh, Eddie, Eddie the Bird from Iron Maiden was really like, they wanted to have these rock uh, emphasis in the game, you know, because all of this was, uh, I say, like more an adult audience. So they picked stuff that were interesting, less for kids, but more for adults. So you can see in this case, they also wanted to shift their target audience, which was not the case with Angry Birds Epic. So a, a brand can reinvent it, itself, and uh, you just have to think creatively. I mean, I think I, I put it like this here. If you've got a crazy idea, make it twice as crazy. That was more or less what they told us when we first started to make the game. And that's why we came up with like hundreds of very diverse uh, birds. So I think even so some of them are definitely not uh, for kids. <laughs> you know, they did some trailers where even we said, like, yeah, that's, that's really kind of risky yeah, to do that. Uh, you, can, you can Google a bit. There's some fun stuff out there about the evolution birds. And one of the things they did here, incorporating the, um, the Iron Maiden sub-brand, if you want to uh, say that, was also a very fun um, trailer. And I'll show you that as well. So uh, you can see here that these kind of things might seem a bit not really related to each other, right? But um, in the end, that was what the fun was surrounding this IP in general, right? The, the, the guys at Rovio, they just 
You could also say they only had this one big brand which everyone knew and they just tried to, of course, make a lot of good games out of it and generate money. Sure, why not? It, everyone knows that and it was, I think, for a while it was the biggest brand on mobile for sure. So, of course, they tried to exploit it in a way. But I think they also did a very good job in not doing the same stuff but really bringing new things uh, into the IP. And as you can see here, the creativity was kind of limitless uh, here and that's, I think it was very nice. Um, way to work with, and uh, for us, of course, a, a fun experience. So um, there was also other things that we did, and um, it shows that IP is also sometimes difficult to handle. In this specific case of Sacred Legends, uh, it was a German IP, so it's an important thing to check, is an IP valid on the whole global market, or is it just you know, important for some countries or for some target audiences. So this might limit the way you can sell it or uh, the target the audience it might appeal to. And um, sure, it was also transferred to mobile. I think you recently maybe also read or saw that, that Blizzard did announce a mobile game with their beloved Diablo brand. I'm not going to compare that, but you can see, yeah, you can also say the community is really Weird sometimes because I really don't think that's cool to to uh, make a big shitstorm out of that. But in the end, that's what happened, right? They did want to see a new game on PC or console and not on mobile, so they just thought it was not cool. Yeah, so know your target audience, know the platforms they might want to play it on, and so forth. Of course, mobile is just so big that you cannot ignore it with a big brand. So it was clear to most people that eventually brands like that are going to move to mobile. This doesn't mean that it will not be persistent on the other platforms as well. But, you know, you have to extend your brand. You have to extend the ways you can sell it and uh, get new target audiences because I can assure you that there is a lot of mobile players out there who would play a Diablo on mobile for sure, but would you never buy it for a PC or a console. In this case, also, we had assets that we could reuse, for example. This is also a good thing about working with IP. In a lot of cases, you can just get pre-made um, material because you don't have to do it from scratch all the time. Now, of course, it has to be up to the um, like state of the art and up to date, and it's not always possible. But um, in some cases, that's a very good kickstart, and it also saves money while developing a new game. That's also a curiosity that we <laughs> had the pleasure to work with in our very early days. It was the second game we actually did at Chimera. And uh, I don't know if all of you even know this brand, but it, back in the days it was super successful on the Nintendo DS. And uh, this guy, Dr. Kawashima, is actually a real person. Also, not everybody knows that. <laughs> so. Interestingly, we, uh, and it was not a very big budget we had back then, it was the, the IP was acquired by a, a local publisher for, for PC and Mac, and uh, they have selected us after we pitched for it, as we usually do. And uh, yeah, we had to send all of the games, we, like these mini games that were made for the brain trainer, we had to send all of them to Japan, and they tested it actually in some laboratory to make sure that you know, it really triggered your brain functions when pl while playing. <laughs> Otherwise, you would probably not deserve the name of Dr. Kawashima. Yeah. So, see, sometimes it's a very weird way how you get approval. So, constraints that are attached to IPs. In this case, that was the case. We did all of those, uh, all of those mini games, more or less as a prototype, with a very simple graphics to make sure we could send them very fast to Japan, get them tested in a laboratory, and then make the real game with graphics out of it, as you can see a little bit here in the screenshot. So, yeah, I already touched on the subject uh, before. That's the downside sometimes of working with IP is that it, you cannot talk about it. We also are working again with Big IP. I cannot tell you more about that. We are also looking to work with that in the future, because especially on mobile, and that's what we do a lot these days, uh, it's very, very hard to be successful without any IPs. It's, it's super tough. You know, the, the visibility, you need so much marketing money, everything. It, you can be super big, but if you have no visibility on the, on the platforms, on iOS, Android, and so forth, then you get no traction, you get no followers, no, no, no downloads, and this all is a downward spiral, and it can exactly be the other way around if you can support it by marketing campaigns that, uh, of course, cost a lot of money, but also very helpfully 
have those IPs they are related to, then you can cross promo them and all those kind of things. So this is, a, a, of course, a science on, on its own, how, how they do these cross promos and IP supports other IP and so forth. But just to get an idea um, about that. OK, I think um, I made it in time, more or less. And I thank you for listening. Yeah, just give me your questions. Any questions? Perfect. Hi there. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, maybe this is a little bit too much off topic, but um, could you uh, elaborate a little bit on um, how your collaboration with Remote Control um, Productions was and what they did for you? And uh, maybe, um, I mean, you've been working with them for quite a while now, so I guess your, your co collaboration must have changed over the time as well. Sure, it's actually really off topic, and I'm inclined to say you can ask me after afterwards. Okay. But I will Sorry. just give you one or two uh, a quick quick answer for it. Still, um, yeah, we did. We are working with remote control. We are part of the developer family for forever. We started together. We founded the company together. So for us, it's more like one big company where we do just different stuff. And so our collaboration is more like we develop the game, remote control sells it, for example, right? They, sell, they find the publisher, they do business development. They also do a lot in HR and finance and so forth. So in our case specifically, because we started the game uh, business together, it's more like we are working together like one big company. For the other studios in remote control, it depends on their setup. Some are not even in Germany. In our case, we are even in the same office, so you can't really compare it. But in our case, uh, they did sell our pitch to Rovio, so I guess that says it all, right, in the end. We are working very closely together to make this a success. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. First of all, um, can you think of any big IP that you were interested in uh, working with that IP and that you, after some consideration process, decided not to go for? It's a tough question, to be honest. Um, Usually, we don't pitch if we are not interested at all. Uh, we had other cases where we were not interested a lot in an IP, and then we did a game for it. I can give you a very weird example. There was a very hard time for us. That was a year before we got Angry Birds Epic Deal. That was the time when everything, the market shifted, and you know, PC games were not that hot anymore. Publishers were really not wanting to invest a lot of money at this kind of point of time. We, we did browser games by then, but they were also shifting more towards mobile, so we had to do a lot of, of small projects for mobile. And one of those things we did was a game called Sarah's Cooking Class, which is a fun game, actually. And, and the people at first thought, like, well, no, let's not do that. This is just not cool at all, right? Because it's a kid's game, it's cooking. But the good thing was, while we pitched for it, because we had to, we had to acquire projects. Right? It was not possible for us to survive as a company in those times if we wouldn't have acquired enough projects, or we would have to, to downsize the company and you know, start from, from scratch or hire people again later. So we just did a couple smaller things, and uh, when we saw this pitch, we said, okay, uh, let's, let's, let's try. And then we came up with a lot of cool things, and the guys who worked on the project later said it was one of the most fun projects that they ever did, like for one or two people, because they had learned a specific thing about it, right? One of them just said, oh, I never did this or that in Unity. That was the first time I did it. So there can always be something attached to it, which is not really related to the IP itself. And uh, we even have people saying, hey, now I got my girlfriend playing because the first time we did something that appealed to a female audience. So kind of cool, right? And we didn't want to pitch it. The other way around, I cannot think of something right now where we really wanted to do it, and then we, we didn't want anymore. I, I have no, nothing in, in mind right now. Thank you. How does it usually work? Do IP holders approach studios or the other way around? Good question. Actually, in the, back in the days when we tried to acquire IP projects, we always had to approach those. And so our business development people always traveled the world, got to every big conference, showed them our stuff, asked if there was any IP we could maybe work with, because that's how you get started. Nowadays, we get approached by 
IP holders, or sometimes by publishers who acquired an IP. That's also a very common case. Like publishers, a lot of publishers that we talked to, they acquired some movie IP, for example, yeah, or, or some other IP, sports IP or something. And then they ask us or other studios if we had, if we could come up with a good pitch for it. That happens a lot. And sometimes we even say, hey, we got a concept that might fit it right away. Happens as well. But sometimes we have to get back, sit down, think about something which would which is suit. And yes, of course, usually you are not reinventing the wheel all the time, every time over and over again. You just have a base idea or you take a proven formula and then you add something new, right? Innovative that that fits the IP a bit better and then you know you extend a core game that already exists to something that it's better or newer and refers more to the IP uh, at hand. Uh, that's what, so we had both cases. We sometimes also approach publishers and try to pitch something for a specific IP if, if applicable. And also as a studio, which do you prefer, working on IPs or your own ideas? For, for mobile, we prefer to work with IP because of the reason I t told you before. It's just very uh, unlikely that you will make a big success with a game which is not based on an IP, <clears throat> unless you have shit loads of money to spend for market to market it. Uh, in case of IP or console, we would always rather, or mostly rather, work with our own stuff. So if we do new concepts, we do a lot of PC stuff and, and try to get up with that again. We also had some uh, recently submitted a new concept to the prototype funding, which we also got approved by the FF. So these are the kind of things that we, we try to do on our own, but we are, not, uh, we are not a publisher, so we will always try to have a publisher um, release the game with us. Uh, so if we do a prototype or our own IP, we still are looking for a publisher who will uh, bring the game to market. Any more questions? I'll be around later for a while as well. So if you have anything, can also be not related to the IP stuff. <laughs> you can ask me. Thank you very much, Thanks, Christian. Thanks, guys. See you then. Good afternoon.